can turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 2. The message this morning is entitled, Prayer for All. 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Hear now the word of the Lord. First of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings, and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good. And it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. In verse 8, I'll just add it to the end here. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, as we turn our attention to your word and to instructions in your word for how we ought to behave in the household of God, I pray, Lord, that you would create a people here in us uh, that are humble, uh, that are thirsty and hungry for your word, Lord, that are looking to you uh, to hear how we ought to walk in a way that's worthy of the gospel. And so help us to hear with that in mind, Lord, help me, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. So our our series in the book of 1 Timothy is called Foundations for Faithfulness, and we've seen several of those foundations, but if I could sum up the first first chapter of 1 Timothy for us, it would be that the foundation of of, of faithfulness is the gospel. We cannot be faithful without the true word of the Lord, without the true gospel, apart from uh, the, the, the message of Christ's saving death on our behalf. Uh, there is no church. There is no household of God. And so we, we have that as our bedrock. We have Christ and Him crucified and risen again as our absolute uh, sure foundation for everything that we do as a church. But as is the case, oftentimes in Paul's letters to the churches, he goes from a section where he describes what is true the, 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 the doctrine, the, the teaching that we must hold fast to. And then he shifts now to say, all right, church, this is what you ought to do about that truth. Right? Because here's the, the, the reality is that doctrine left to itself, it just puffs up. It just causes us to be uh, arrogant and ignorant of the way that we ought to walk things out. We cannot be godly by just knowing the truth. We have to put it into practice. And so Paul then turns in the last half of this letter, as he does in many other letters, not really half, but this section at least, uh, and he turns then to practical instructions for how the church ought to behave in the household of God based on the fact that we are all in Christ through the gospel. So first, right off the bat, I have to say, if you are not in Christ, then this instruction means nothing for you. Right? If, if we are not a body of believers, all of us individually, but together joined with Christ, then these instructions will only feel like law, like dead uh, legalism to us. That, okay, I have to check this thing off the list and then maybe God will accept me as godly. That's not the truth. The truth is we are in Christ. We have we, we have laid our lives down at the altar. We have, we have come to him with nothing in our hands, no righteousness of our own, and we have pleaded that, uh, his blood on our behalf. And if that is us, then we come to these things as willing 
followers of Christ wanting to know, okay, Lord, my Lord, how would you have me serve you? Right? There's a big difference, isn't there, between those two things. There's a cheerfulness that comes from knowing who we are. We are secure in Christ and then coming to instruction versus thinking, well, I, you know, he told me I have to do this, so I guess I got to get that done and I guess I got to do this. And man, I don't really like that, but he said, you know, that's, I guess that's what we do in the church, so I guess we just got to go with you know, there, there's a big difference in attitude when we have the gospel as our foundation. So, so with that in mind, we, we turn to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. And what we read here is a truly countercultural uh, instruction. Okay? There, there's a lot of talk in the church about being countercultural. Now, that's true because our culture is ungodly. Right? So we think of ways, how can we be counterculture? How can we be different than the culture? How can we be uh, lights uh, that, that are not uh, hid under a bushel? How can we be cities that are set on a hill? We want to be uh, uh, something that's different than the world around us. Well, one of the ways that Paul says we can do that is by prayer. By prayer. And specifically, the type of prayer uh, that he gives us here. Now, last week we, we heard Paul tell Timothy that he is to, verse 18 of chapter 1, wage the good warfare. And for some of us, in fact, most of us, that, that idea of warfare doesn't really hit home, right? Because uh, by, by God's grace, we have rarely uh, had war on our soil. We have a few times, right? But, but oftentimes it's been a sea away from us, right? It's been uh, miles away from us, uh, even continents away and, and sometimes, even when it has been on foreign shores, the people here have, have put in all, their, their all to the war effort, right? You think of like World War I and World War II having ration, you know, eating off of rations and, and uh, planting victory gardens because we're supporting the war effort, right? When everybody was in it together, even though it was uh, separated from us, it's not so much the case anymore where it seems like warfare is something, a battle that rages far away from us, but what we saw last week was uh, that, that this war that, that is, is against the truth, this war that is against faithfulness in the church is waged on our soil. In fact, it's waged in our homes. It's waged in our hearts as individuals. I heard uh, one, one uh, kind of Christian cultural commentator say that, that uh, a lot of us like to think that we can avoid the culture wars. Right? We want to try to stay out of the culture wars. And, and, and he said, you don't have that option because the culture is warring against you. You are a part of it, whether you would like to be or not. And so the question is, how do we wage this war? It is an all-hands-on-deck type of scenario. And so what Paul lays in front of uh, the church is very specific instructions on how to do that. Now, I want to give you a summary of these seven verses here, and then we'll go back and see each of the points. So Paul urges Timothy, in verse 1, to make prayer a priority for the public gathering of the church. Verse 1 says that all kinds of prayer should be offered for all kinds of people. And I say kinds there because he follows verse 1 with a, a category of person who may be neglected in corporate prayer, namely kings and those in authority. Verse 2 says that we should pray for civil authorities with the purpose of peace in our minds, knowing that the well-being of our leaders is a prime factor in our ability to live as God would have us to live. Verse 3 explains that this prayer is good because it pleases God who desires all kinds of people to be saved and to know the truth. Verse 4, the reason that prayer applies to all people is is because salvation is offered in no other name but Christ's. So in other words, what God desires, He provides through Christ, verses 5 and 6, which then is the message proclaimed by Paul, not only to Jews, but to all people, verse 7, Jew and Gentile. So that's the 30,000-foot flyover view of this passage. Now let's dig into the details. First of all, notice the priority of public prayer. The priority of public prayer. Paul says that prayer must be a priority in the church. Prayer must be a priority in the church. 
in the list of duties that the church must be faithful in. Prayer is not the only thing. Okay, we will see throughout 1 Timothy, and of course then in the New Testament, we see prayer is not the only thing that the church must be faithful in, but it is something. And it's something that must not be neglected. And in Timothy's case, in the church at Ephesus, prayer obviously must be emphasized along with other things like godly men and women and godly leaders and reading of the scripture and preaching of the word that we'll see later on. It's a bit like if you were to go to the doctor and the doctor would tell you that, uh, hey, I, I think you, you need to prioritize protein in your diet. Right? The, that does not mean, the doctor is not telling you to only ever eat steak, as much as some of us would love to hear that. Right? He's not telling you, uh, prioritize this to the exclusion of everything else. Right? He's, but he's saying, in the current condition that you are, you need to make sure that you are getting this in your diet. Right? Likewise, in the case at the church of Ephesus, Paul tells Timothy that in the situation that you're in, you need to make sure that prayer is a priority. Right? This tells us that likely prayer, and specifically this kind of prayer, is probably lacking. And it probably has something to do with the false teachers that are in Ephesus stirring up trouble in that church Right, because what happened with those teachers is they were a rather exclusive bunch. If you remember, they had their genealogies, they had their mythologies, they, they had all these designations and categories that were kind of mystical and, and right, if you could trace your bloodline and all this kind of stuff. So what happened is you end up with a people, a group of people that apparently are really the true church, right? They're really the ones that are in and everybody else is out. And so Paul says, okay, if you're going to confront this false teaching, one of the ways that you're going to have to do it is through prayer. But notice I said public prayer. I said public prayer, the priority of public prayer. And I say that because the context shows us that Paul has the, the, the public gathering of the church in mind. I don't mean like our church going down in the courthouse lawn and having church out there. I mean us here together. Right? What, what this is not saying, I don't think, is like what Jesus warned about in Matthew chapter 6. Right? If you remember that passage, Jesus is warning about the hypocrisy of the Pharisees who go into the public market and make these big, ornate, long prayers for everybody to hear and to think, whoa, that person's really spiritual. Right? And what Jesus says of that, in that case, to address that issue is, rather than that, go in your closet and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret, and your, your father who sees in secret will reward you. Right? The point of Jesus' instruction is that when you go out and you pray with all kinds of majesty and all kinds of spiritual hyper-language, what you're trying to do is actually gain rewards yourself, whether it's social or religious or whatever it is. And he says, forget about those rewards. If you're trying to do that, what you should do instead is go pray in secret and get the true rewards. That's Jesus' Uh, correction of that situation. In this case, Paul says, what you need to do when you gather together as a church is make sure that you pray for people. Make sure that you pray for people you might otherwise be uh, uh, tempted to not pray for them. Verse 8, which we'll get to next week, verses 8 and following make plain that what Paul has in mind here is when the church, when the, those who are in Christ gather together for public worship. Men and women, both are listed in this chapter. Ephesians chapter 6, the letter to the Ephesians, would include children, boys and girls that are a part of this worship, that are, that are in the gathering together, that should be uh, prioritizing prayer. Now, as we learned in Sunday school this morning, some of us, that our salvation is personal. Right? Christ saves people. You have, you must have a personal relationship with Christ. Your name must be written in the book of life. Your sins must be nailed with Jesus to the cross, specifically in order for them to be wiped clean off of your record. But Jesus is not an individualist. And the church is not full of individualistic, individuals 
right? So in other words, it's not just a me and Jesus movement. The church did not say, he, he saved us individually, but he saved us together as individuals. So in other words, when you're united to Christ, you're united to Christ with all the other people who are united with Christ, whether you like that idea or not. You are one in Christ. We are one of another. And the privilege of God's people has always been to gather and worship according to his command. He tells us what is good and pleasing to him. And in this case, it is uh, public prayer. Prayer, a part of our gathering. Now, it is prayer. Do you notice verse 1 lists several words that all describe prayer, but kind of from different angles. So that word supplications refers to requests made uh, for the benefit or on behalf of other people. We are to pray for other people and for their benefit. Uh, the second word, prayers, is the word that's often used to describe our worship before God when we ask for his blessing and care, right? So, so what we could say, what we gathered here to do this entire time that we're together this morning is prayer. And that prayer includes preaching the word and reading the word and, and singing and praying and all that stuff is included in our worship, in our prayer before God asking for his blessing. Uh, intercession is another word that ref, uh, ref, refers to urgent entreaties or urgent requests that are boldly taken to the higher authority who has something to do with it, right? So this is the, this is the idea that when um, in, in other, uh, other ages where the, the king or the lord of the area would hold what they called, they'd hold court, right? So in other words, they'd sit on their throne and they'd have an open room, and people that were under their leadership would be allowed to come in and make an entreaty to them. Say, Lord, the, the, the issue, King, the, the issue is that uh, we had raiders that came and knocked down our barn, and I don't know what to do, my family's struggling, and you go to the one who has something to do with it. Right? You go and you make an entreaty, an intercession to that person. This is what prayer is, in part, is we go to the higher authority urgently taking our requests to him because he's the one who can do something about it. So it's intercession. And lastly, it's thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is acknowledgement in gratitude of what God has done. Uh, one commentator said that this is the only one of the four words that will continue on in heaven. We'll have no need to make entreaties there. Right? We'll have no need to pray with supplication or prayers there, but we'll have plenty to be thankful for. And we'll only ever gain things to be thankful for. And so why not practice here? Right? These, these, these angles at prayer fill out our, our, our understanding of what we do, what we ought to have in our mind when we bow our heads together. So the instruction is to make prayer in all its forms a priority of our gatherings together. Now you may remember our study back in Acts chapter 2 verse 42 where the early church got together and one of the things that was listed as the four foundational pillars that describe the early church was prayer along with the, the, uh, the, the teaching of the apostles, the fellowship, uh, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. And so here again I think we ought to be absolutely convinced totally convinced that prayer is not simply to be something that begins and ends our meetings. It's not simply something to be tacked on uh, as a part of our worship. It's not simply a point in your bulletin in the order of service. But prayer is to be something that, that we look forward to as the people of God. One of, the, one of the main reasons that we gather together as his people is to bow our heads together as his people to come to him together as his people and entreat his favor, entreat his help, ask for the things that we know are pleasing to him. This ought to be bedrock as a foundation for our faithfulness. So let me ask us, are we a praying people? And notice I didn't say, are you a praying person? I hope you are. But are we a praying people. You've maybe heard the illustration before. Um, Charles Spurgeon at one point, and, you know, he had the, 
largest church in London. 10,000 people, they said, back in the, the late 1800s. You think about that. No microphones, and yet preached to 10,000 people. And, and at one point of the service, he, somebody else was preaching at, at a different time, and so he was giving a tour of their building, and, and somebody asked him, uh, Mr. Spurgeon, can you, just, can you tell us, how, how did this all come to be? How did this come about? And he takes this dear lady down to the boiler room and opens the door where during each service there is a group of people gathered on their knees before the Lord praying for God to pour out his spirit on the gathering that was meeting above them. And Spurgeon says, here is the power of this gathering in the prayer. Are we a praying people? Prayer ought to be a priority. Public prayer ought to be a priority. But notice that prayer is to be offered for all people. This is our second point this morning. Prayer is to be offered for all people. Uh, verse 2, these types of prayers and thanksgivings be made for all people. Now, when we think of prayer, all people, without exception, doesn't immediately strike us as an odd thing to pray for. Because right? you've heard... Uh, individuals pray, Lord, I pray that you would please bless every person without exception. Amen. Right? We hear prayers like that. Lord, help every person who is sick to get better. Amen. Right? And we think that's not automatic, like that's not right away something that strikes us as odd. Why? Because we're praying to God who made all things without exception. Right? We're praying to God who made all human beings without exception exception, and we are praying to God who is powerful beyond all exception to do everything that is in his holy will to do. And so to pray for all people without exception is not necessarily a thought that, that strikes us as odd. But the question is, is that what Paul means here? Right? Is that what he is saying in this text? Does all mean every person without exception, or rather, does all mean every people without exception? That maybe gets more to the heart of it. Now, immediately following this, for all people, in verse 2, the word for, it starts, starts out the verse, and then it's repeated with two examples. So, pray for all people, for kings, and all who are in high positions. The first word, Kings is the word for emperors or the word for uh, rulers. It's the same word that's used in 1 Peter 2, verses 13 to 17, that says, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be the emperor or the king as supreme, or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God. That by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Right? So Peter says that we are to submit ourselves. We are to obey those. We are to honor those who are in positions of leadership in the government around us. Now, think about this. To those whom we are subject should be the subjects of our prayers. Those who, whom God, Romans 13 says, those whom God has placed over us, the, the word there is that they are ministers, they are deacons of God. They are his servants. He has put them in those positions in order to punish the evil and reward the good. Those people ought to be the subject of our prayers. Now, this is not to the exclusion of other types of people. Paul is not saying just pray for kings and all in high positions. But what Paul is doing is he says, I want you to pray for all people meaning all kinds of people, for instance, this category that you may, be, you may be tempted to neglect. Kings, for instance. Now, why might we neglect to pray for those who are in authority over us? Right? There's lots of reasons. One of them being 
they're in authority. They have all the resources they need. Why would they need me to pray for them? They can have whatever they want. Right? Or we could say those people in authority, are, for, the, for the, the most part, they don't trust God. Why would I pray for them who are, in some cases, God-haters? Right? Or we think, I don't really like that guy. I don't really like that lady. I don't like what they stand for. I don't like what they're doing. I don't like the job they're doing. I don't think they belong in that office. Why would I pray for them? Well, it's a hard truth this morning, but... but Paul, frankly, doesn't care about your opinion of those leaders when he tells us to pray for them. Do you know who the leader was, who the king was when Paul gave this instruction? Nero. Do you know what Nero did to Christians? He used them as torches for his parties in his lawn. And Paul says, I want you to pray for Nero. Peter says, I want you to honor Nero. I, I want, in fact, I want you to obey Nero. I want you to obey Pilate. I want you to pray for him. I want you to obey Festus and Herod. I want you to pray for those men and honor them in the positions there. Because why? God raises up kings and God tears down kings. God takes the most evil kings, for instance, the king of Assyria, and uses that king as his instrument to carry out his plan in the world. And then when he is done with him, he sets him aside. God does it. And God tells us to pray for them. Friends, it's quite hard to pray for people whom you've spent your time cursing with your tongue, or rather with your thumbs. James 3.11 says, Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? And yet with our mouth we both bless our God and Savior and curse those who are made in his image. Brothers, these things ought not to be so. So that's for whom we should pray. But why? Why should we pray for these individuals? We are to pray for all people, he says, verse 2, with peaceful purpose. He says that, that word that tells us this is the purpose, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. So the motivation for our prayers, for the, our officials, is partly selfish, but not really. Uh, one, one commentator, Knight, uh, says that a tranquil life is to be prayed for as a setting in which the ultimate goal may be accomplished. And what is the ultimate goal according to verse 2? That we may lead a peaceful and quiet life. That's the setting. What's the goal? Godly and dignified in every way. Right? God wants us to be able to live a life that is godly and dignified or respectable. And the best way for us to be able to do that is for our lives to be peaceful and quiet. In other words, not full of tumult all the time. Now, that word godly there is, this is the first time it's used, and it's going to be used uh, ten more times in the pastoral letters, uh, to describe a way of life that adorns the doctrine of God, the true teaching. So here's what godliness does. Godliness takes the words that are spoken, the words that are taught, and it pairs it together with a life that uh, that, that corresponds to that, that word, right? So godliness doesn't just look at the, the, the details of the text or, or doesn't just describe what the truth is. Godliness pairs your truth with your life, right? You, you not only talk the talk, but you walk the walk. You, as the scriptures say, you live, worth, live a life that is worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's godliness, because the reality is that's the first place that people will point to if they want to discredit the truth. They're going to point to, yeah, I know what you say, but, but I, I see you live just like everybody else does. So why in the world would I listen to you? Apparently the truth actually has no power to change lives because it sure hasn't changed yours. That's the criticism we will get. So Paul says, no, we need to live godly. That word dignified, it's the word respectable. Respectable. 
right? And, and we, we can have a, a culture where everybody, you know, kind of just tightens their tie up nice and holds their head up and, you know, they just look like very respectable people and, you know, they'd never be seen doing that or this or the other. That's not what Paul is talking about. It, the word respectable means that it's a life that people look into and they have to give it credit, right? In other words, there's not hypocrisy there. So, so when somebody says, I'm a Christian, what they ought to be able to do is that person ought to be able to look at your life and say, I probably should give their, their, their words a hearing because they certainly mean what they say. I can tell. Right? They live a life of gravity. Right? They, they, live a, they live a life that means something. That's not just flitting about all the time, all over the place, from one thing to the next, but instead it's rock solid. It's built on a foundation. It's obvious that they know what, the, what the, their God requires of them, and they live according to it. I ought to give them a hearing. That's what Paul says ought to be the case. Now, an example of this type of thing working out is in Acts chapter 21. Paul goes back to Jerusalem, and some people, some Jews from Asia, possibly even from Ephesus, see Paul in the temple, and they think he's there to start a riot, and so they start a riot, right? So they, they, they kick up a big fuss in the temple, and what happens is the tribune, ultimately, the Roman tribune, the, the governing official over that area has to come to break up the squabble. And after the tribune gains peace in the temple courts, Paul turns to him and says, may I speak to the people? And the tribune gives him permission, and what does Paul do? preaches the gospel like well we got a crowd here the, the the governing officials have done their job in keeping the peace and why are they going to do that so that the gospel can be preached right paul uses that opportunity he said okay tribune you did your job i'm going to do mine now you've set the stage now i'm going to put on the act i'm going to proclaim the gospel that you have made possible for us to proclaim that's the that's the job of rulers now, we know that's not ultimately what rulers always do, right? And we don't have time to get into what happens then when rulers don't do that, right? Because obviously, the, the instruction to pray for rulers does not require whether those, or does not uh, hinge on whether those rulers are obeying the Lord or not. Example, Nero. And we are to pray for these people because that is what is best for peace. It's like what Jeremiah 29, 7 says, Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find welfare. It's good for you. It's good for us if the city around us is in good shape. So pray for that. Now, it is true that all who seek to live a godly life will be persecuted. 2 Timothy 3.12 And history has proven that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. But it is also evident that great gospel advances are made when peace abounds in the land. Right? When, when, the, when the officials do their job and the church does its job, great gospel advances can take place. So we should pray for that. probably need to say a word about this uh, in our day and age, especially in an election year. You know, honor, honor is a lost virtue in our culture. Honoring those whom are in leadership over us is a lost art, a lost virtue. We don't value honor in our culture as we ought to. And yet Paul says that we ought to do that. We ought to pray. Right? They're not going to always get it right, but we are to honor them with our prayers. Right? A respectful correction to a governing ruler coming from a godly, dignified, honorable Christian with no ridicule to be found in their mouth or on their Facebook page is far more likely to gain a hearing than somebody who has a Let's Go Brandon flag on their front porch. No offense, Brandon. <laughs> He's like, that's me. No, I don't think that's you. Do you, do you understand? Right? If, if that leader that you go to, if ultimately they stray from the path of their job and you as a Christian go to them and respectfully offer, a, uh, which we're allowed to do. In fact, we're, we're supposed to do in our, in our country, 
we go to them and we say, that's not, that's, not, that's not me. You're not representing me by that action. And they say, okay. And then, you know, they go back and they look you up. And next thing, you know, they see that all you've ever done is mocked them and ridiculed them and cursed them. Do you think that leader is going to listen to your rebuke, your advice? Of course not. Right? Christians, we uphold our side of the deal. We live in a godly and dignified way. And then we call our leaders to do the same thing. And we tell them with honesty, without hypocrisy, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. And here's what I'm praying for you. And here's when the last time I prayed for you was. And I'm going to keep on praying for you. I'm going to ask God to bless you. I'm going to ask God to give you all that you need to do this job in a way that honors him and is good for the people. Seems to be like that, that would be fitting for peace more than hoisting these hateful flags. So we pray for all people because it is pleasing to God. Notice verse 3. This, this prayer, is good and pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. Now, this right here, the, these two requirements ought to be every single category or every single um, uh, way that we determine what we ought to do in the church. It ought to boil down to two, these two things. Is it good and does it please God? Everything that we do as a church should ultimately go back to these two things. Is it good? Is it pleasing to God? It's not about whether does it fit my preference. It's not about whether does it make me comfortable. It's not about whether does it look good to the city around us. It's does it, is it good and does it please the Lord? Right? We want to please God. Do you? Honestly ask yourself the question, do I want to please the Lord? Is that my life? Is that, is that what I frame my life around? Do I want the, the, the look of satisfaction from my heavenly Father? Is his smile your greatest satisfaction? Is all you want to hear, truly, is, is, every, is your life uh, 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 governed by well done, good and faithful servant? Do you want to please the Lord? He is a kind Father. And that he tells us exactly what would gain his approval. He doesn't leave us guessing. He doesn't wait for us to, to show ourselves to be, you know, the type of person that he wants. You know, you know how many young men's lives have been ruined because they just want their dad to say something positive about them. And they don't know what he would think. They don't actually know what it is that would please him. But man, they're going to try to do it. Man, they're going to go after it. They're going to try to please their father. Look friend, at your good and pleasing God. Look at your faithful father who, who, who tells you, pray for your leaders. And if you do that, that's good and pleasing. I'm proud of you, in a sense, in a way of speaking, that you listen to my command. Right? But notice, this is for our peace. This is something that is not just pleasing to God. What is pleasing to God is good for us. And so, it's not really selfish, and yet somewhat, if you want a peaceful life, this is what we ought to do. Please the Lord. That's what's best for his people. But notice also, too, what it is, the type of prayer, why this is pleasing to God. Verse 4, it is God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Right? God, our Savior, desires all people to be saved. So the focus of our prayers for all people, namely those in authority over us, ought to be their salvation. Would it not be a peace-filled world with men and women from every level to every corner of creation worship the Lord, profess his name, love each other, govern according to God's word, would that not be a peaceful world? Of course it would. Paul says pray for that. And notice then what results from our prayer, right? It is salvation for people. This is why God wants us to do this. Pray that they would be saved. Why? Because I desire that they would be saved. 
But notice what salvation entails. He says, for them to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Right? So we, we begin in our salvation. We begin with the word of Christ. Right? Christ's word in the gospel is preached to us. And what we are told in the scriptures is that the Holy Spirit comes along when that word is preached and he, he takes our hard heart of stone and he turns it into a heart of flesh. Another passage says that the Spirit comes and lifts the veil up from our eyes so that way we can actually hear and understand what's being said to us in the gospel. The Spirit comes along and does that through the preaching of the gospel. But notice also what it does is it gives us a knowledge of the truth. Jesus said to go into all the world, make disciples of every nation, baptizing them and teaching them to obey all that I command you. Right? So part of discipleship, this is what discipleship is. You, you bring them in by the word of Christ and then you grow them by the word of Christ. You teach them everything that there is to know. We go to the word and we say, okay, Lord, I'm your servant Give me my commands. What is it that's pleasing to you? I want it. I want to live that way. And of course, if this is what is taking place, if people are coming to this type of salvation where it's not just a get out of hell free card, where it's not just quote unquote fire insurance, but it is actually a life that begins and continues with Christ, that's a peaceful life. That's a godly life. That's a dignified life. That's a church that is on a solid foundation that can grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus and can be a city set on a hill. This is what we are to work for. But what about this kings? Because we don't want to leave the side. Even though Paul is talking about other categories, he specifically lists these. Why is it that kings ought to come to a knowledge of the truth? Proverbs 8, 15 and 16 says, By me, namely by wisdom, kings reign and rulers decree what is just. By me, princes, by wisdom, princes rule and nobles and all who govern justly. How is it that kings will do what is right and peaceful? By knowing God's word. Right? So, so to go to a king and say, uh, to go to a governor or senator and say, um, Senator, I understand you have this bill in front of you this week. And I just want, I want you to know what God's word says about X, Y, or Z. I, I want you to know, you know, God has placed you in that position of leadership. And, and, and I pray for you in that position. That is a weighty matter. And, I, and I, I pray that you would do the thing that is honoring to God because it's going to be what's peaceful for everybody. It's going to be good for your people. It's going to be good for you. Right? We, we will rejoice in you following what is true and wise and noble. I, 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 there, there's examples of this right now. To, to go to somebody and instead of ridiculing them, saying that, you know what, I can guarantee you that every decision you make that accords with godliness and righteousness you have our churches, our church has your back. You have our church's uh, uh, approval in that matter. Man, can you imagine if you were in that position? Right? Even if it's selfish motives that lead politicians to do things, it'd be the right kind of selfish motive, wouldn't it? Paul provides, or excuse me, God provides salvation for all. This is why it's pleasing to him. What God desires, he provides. The twin truths of verse 5 provide the theological basis for why we must pray for all kinds of people to come to a knowledge of the truth. First, he says, there is one God. There is only one God. And similarly, there is only one mediator. Right? So there is one God and there is one mediator between men, the man, Christ Christ. Jesus. So because there is only one God and because all fall short of what it takes to be reconciled or be brought into that one God's presence, we need a mediator, right? We need somebody to stand between the two parties and work out some sort of a deal, some sort of an arrangement. We don't have standing to be in the court of God on our own. We have offended God. We are the ones that, that are deserving of his punishment. And so there is a, a mediator that's required in Christ Jesus, the righteous. We need an advocate, in other words. So the way that God provides that salvation is through that one mediator to the one God, 
it says, by giving himself as a ransom for all, verse 6. How is it that, that this one mediator successfully mediated something between God and men? By giving himself, by dying in our stead. That word there, ransom, is a compound word, anti and lutron in the Greek. Anti meaning instead of, lutron meaning a ransom price. So Christ Jesus is an instead of price. He is a substitution price, right? So instead of us, Christ laid down his life and paid so that we could get out of that debt, right? He is our ransom. But the other, the only other two places where that word lutron, ransom is used in the New Testament is the same saying of Christ found in Mark's gospel and Matthew's gospel. Mark 10, 45 says, For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Christ's death was not only an instead of price, though. It was not just a substitute price to release us from our bondage. It was also a purchase price. It says, who gave himself as a ransom and instead of price for all. That word for there is different than the word for in verse 5, the beginning of verse 5. This word for is on behalf of all. So Christ paid the ransom price. He paid the substitute, but in, in doing so, he didn't just bring us back so that we no longer had any claim on our life and we were free in ourselves. What Jesus did in giving his life was he paid our debt and he paid our purchase price. So, so we're not in, in Christ. It's not that we're just brought up on level playing ground. We are bought. We are purchased, so we get transferred, as Paul says in Romans 6, we get transferred from being slaves of sin to now being slaves of righteousness, right? We don't go without being a master. You are never your own master, right? But in Christ, we get moved from the domain of darkness into the domain of light. We have, uh, we're taken out of the old man and we put on the new man, and this is what God desires, and this is what God provides for us in Jesus, Now, for whom did Christ provide this ransom? Is it for all people without exception? And notice what we just said, right? If we understand these words carefully, that this ransom price is paid as a substitute for those who deserve death and as a purchase price for those who deserve death. Does God purchase every single person? Does every single person belong to Christ? And I think if we, if we answer that honestly, we say, well, no. That's not what happens. Right? Unless if you are a universalist and believe that in the end, every single person will be saved. God wouldn't ultimately damn anybody. God wouldn't actually send anybody to hell. If you believe that, then that's how you'll read this verse, is that God not only purchased everybody out of slavery, but he also redeemed everybody, whether they want to be redeemed or not. And ultimately, in the end, everything will work out. All humans will come to him, and we'll be all, you know, one merry uh, humanity and brotherhood in Christ. But that obviously flies in the face of what we know in Scripture. That that is not the case. And so what, what what is this saying here? I think it's saying that, that this, our salvation does not hinge on whether we, you know, may, maybe make that choice. It's not that God paid the ransom price to make us equal and then we took it from there. And then we, we, we gave ourselves to Christ. Right? Instead, those whom Christ died for, he purchased. He bought us. Right? As, as uh, John chapter 6 says... All that the Father has given to me, I have not lost a single one. Think about that. Not a single one of those for whom Christ died is lost. Right? Your salvation in Christ is not a, a, a possibility. It is a surety. 
right? You do not have to wonder in your life whether your salvation is assured or not. You can take it to the bank that in Christ, I have no doubt whatsoever because Christ purchased me, right? Christ brought about my redemption. He paid my purchase price and it was effective. It was not that Christ just wrote a check and laid it on the table just to wait and see whether somebody was going to pick it up and cash it or not. No, Jesus he, he paid that price and he handed that check to the Father and he said, here, I'm going to buy every single one of those. This is what Ephesians uh, 1 tells us, that before the foundation of the world, right, Christ predestined those who would come to him. This is, this is what John teaches, that uh, in John chapter 10, when Jesus says, the shepherd knows those who are his and call them by name. And when I call them, they come to me. Right? Th this is not a picture of, of God sitting, twiddling, twiddling his thumbs, anxiously waiting on the front porch to see whether the prodigal son comes back or not. Right? This, this is a picture of God who, who, who writes our name in the book of life pays our price in Christ, draws us to himself graciously, takes our heart of stone and makes it a heart of flesh. And, and, and then those for whom he died are those that will worship him around the throne for all eternity. And so pray for people. Pray for all kinds of people. This message is not exclusive. It is not that, that only certain people qualify under that. It's not just the Jews. It's not just the Gentiles. It's not just Americans. It's not just Mexicans. It's not just rich. It's not just poor. It's not just the kings. It's not just the poor people, right? It is all people. God will save some from them. God will pull out from every category of human, every tribe and nation and language and tongue. God has the, those whom are his in those people. And so what Paul says to Timothy is, do not limit your prayers because of uh, the, the status of a certain people or a certain person. Don't, don't decide someday that God must not care about that people group over there. No, God will, will redeem people from every tribe and language and nation and tongue. What, what this instruction does is it does not limit our prayers down to only the elect because you can't know that. I can't know whom Christ has called to be his. Instead, we are to pray for all people because God will ultimately save them. God desires. Don't you want to pray what God desires? And then he says, lastly, in verse 6 and 7, uh, verse 7, that is, that this is the message that Paul preaches. It is an unqualified gospel message. It is a message that for all who come to me, I will in no way cast out. If you come to Christ with faith in your heart that he paid your ransom and that that ransom is going to be good on that day of judgment, if you trust in Jesus to cover all of your sins, to, to give you all the righteousness needed to stand before the Father, you can be assured that that day you will stand as one of these people that Christ desired to save. Because what Jesus desires, Jesus provides. He will accomplish it, and not one will be lost. That is what we are to preach. That is what we are to pray for. That is a, a, a firm foundation on which we can stand. And so some things you're going to hear in our church. When you come to prayer meeting on Wednesday nights, if, you're, if we're going to be a people devoted to prayer, I encourage you to, to make that a priority. You're going to hear us pray for our government leaders every Wednesday. You're going to hear us pray for the salvation of all people. You're going to hear us pray that God would do what he says he wants us to do. Right? From this pulpit, you're going to hear us pray. You're going to hear me pray or whoever's here pray for those who are in leadership over us. Why? Because God says, this is what I want you to do. This is how you ought to behave in the household of God. And we want to walk faithfully in that. So let's pray. God, I thank you for a sure foundation. I thank you that we don't have our salvation or our church hinging on the maybes of Scripture, but hinging on the duns of Scripture. 
It is done. It is finished. It is accomplished in Jesus. Give us a heart to pray for those who are lost, Lord. Give us a conviction to pray for those who lead. Cause us to be faithful in these and everything else that you call us to. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.